uh, the chairman of Lloyd's of London, the big sexy beast himself, John Nelson. <laughs> uh, well, I hesitate to respond to that, but um, uh, what I will say is that uh, obviously we have a change of uh, pace here with, with insurance. Uh, we are the warm-up act for the finance ministers. And just to warn you, may, you may, I've been warned, you may hear a rustling coming down here as they arrive. Please concentrate on insurance while they arrive. Um, it's not often that general insurance actually gets uh, an opportunity to uh, expose itself to an audience like this. And I, by general insurance, I do mean general, not life. Uh, and I think one of the uh, messages I hope you will go away with this afternoon is that insurance does play an absolutely fundamental role, not only in economic security for businesses, institutions, and governments, but also uh, in economic growth. Um, so this session is really going to address that. And I've got uh, three ex extremely distinguished colleagues who I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. And we're going to have a talk, an interactive talk amongst us about that, and then I'll open it up to questions. But let me just start with a very few statistics. The global insurance industry takes in, uh, we estimate, uh, over $4.6 trillion of uh, premium income. We employ uh, around, that's annually, we employ around 2 million people, and we currently have over $25 trillion of assets under management. And that accounts for round about 12% of global financial assets. To give you another figure uh, in what I call the tragic catastrophe space, which is part of what we do in terms of putting economies and countries back on their feet, just to give you a number, in 2011, when we had that extraordinary coincidence of catastrophes in uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand earthquake, the Japanese tsunami, the Thailand floods, the Australian floods, and then the US windstorms. We paid out then uh, around about $110 billion just on catastrophe claims. And I think the other thing I would say immodestly for the insurance industry is that we have come through some very difficult macroeconomic times, more or less unscathed, and most importantly, we have kept paying our claims quickly, putting uh, economies and countries and uh, businesses back on their feet. And one thing I think which will, is going to come out of this, uh, as you'll hear, is the fundamental importance of the commercial discipline of ensuring these risks and these emerging risks uh, and how that improves risk management. And if we look at the developed world particularly, I think one of the successes of business generally is a massive improvement in risk management. And I think that's uh, uh, something which we will talk a bit about. And then if you look at the changing risk lan landscape, we've obviously got the obvious points of climate change. We've got the rise of the new economies. At the moment, 70% of world GDP, as you know, is in the developed world, 30% in developing, 25 years' time, that's going to flip. So the challenge for the insurance industry, obviously, is to adjust to that. Um, and then, of course, we have the digital revolution, the tech we were hearing, hearing about earlier, and that creates a whole list of, of, of new risks. And I think the, the other question is relating to insurance is underinsurance. Lloyd's, my own organization, published a report at the end of last year which showed there is a significant degree of underinsurance. Uh, the, the, the developed world is pretty good, not surprisingly. That ver very well organized country, the Netherlands, is top of the tree. At the bottom, not surprisingly, is China. But the Chinese government, it's interesting, are taking this very seriously because what a part of what our research shows is that if you improve insurance penetration by 1%, you actually create funds equivalent to 2% of. GDP in most countries to uh, help the economy grow. And secondly, you relieve the insurance claim burden on the taxpayer by anything up to 10 times that, 22%. So these are big questions. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that uh, my panel, and I might just ask them to stand up and walk up as, we, uh, uh, as I introduce them. First of all, we have Greg Case, 
who is the president and CEO of Aon, which is the world's largest insurance broker and risk management company. Uh, they employ over 65,000 employees in 150 countries. Uh, and of course, very welcome, they have moved their head office to London. So thank you, Greg. Uh, secondly, Mr. Shuzo Sumi. Mr. Sumi uh, is the president uh, of Tokyo Marine, the most international of the great Japanese property casualty companies. And they, are, uh, they employ over 30,000 people worldwide. They have businesses in the UK, the US, uh, and Europe. And then from closer to home, we have Nicholas von Baumhardt, who many of you will know as the chairman of Munich Re, the world's largest uh, reinsurer. And Nicholas's company manages assets of over 238 billion uh, in euros and employs over 60,000 staff. And one of the nice things for me is that all three of us have a very close connection. Uh, Greg Case is the single, with Aon, the single biggest customer of the Lloyds market. Uh, and the other uh, two gentlemen in the form of Nicholas and Sumi-san both have important syndicates in Lloyds. And then just to say a word about Lloyds, I'm chairman of Lloyds. We are the only physical uh, insurance market and the only insurance market in the world based here, of course, in London. Uh, and we are, we believe, the global hub for specialist insurance and reinsurance. So with that, uh, we'll kick off the discussion. And I thought what we might start with uh, is, and I'm looking at Greg, I'm afraid, to start with, is just talking about, Greg, the change that we're seeing in the risk landscape going forward. Now, how is the insurance industry addressing that? And how, how is that going to help growth? Well, first of all, John, it's a pleasure to be here with you and Nicholas and Sumasan. Um, the insurance landscape, uh, it's a complicated one and getting more so. The commercial insurance world, as you see it today, um, in our view, is changing faster maybe than it ever has at any time in the global economy. Um, and it's important because when we talk to clients all around the world, one of the big roadblocks, barriers to growth, is fear of risk. So it's an absolutely relevant topic. So what drives this? Um, a lot of factors, I will point to two. One is just overall magnitude of risk in the world today is going up on the commercial side. Uh, it's true for a whole variety of reasons, changing demographics, greater urbanization of the population, but the magnitude of risk in the world today is in fact increasing. Not just traditional risks as we know them and that Lloyd's has looked at and my colleagues have looked at over time, but the non-traditional risks. Risks like the how do you deal with uh, global warming and sustainability and pandemic, cyber risk, uh, identity theft, uh, even supply chain, uh, create a level of risk today that's greater than ever before. That's then compounded by complexity. Not only is there more risk now than ever before, it interacts in a different way. And you know, an example I just might give is, if you think about the floods in Thailand, um, that was obviously an incredible personal tragedy in the region, but it ends up being a global supply chain trauma that was greater than anybody could have ever have envisioned. So the level of risk in the world today, John, as we see it, is going up and going up substantially. Uh, in that context, how's the insurance world that we access every day, how has it reacted? I think you'd have to say um, it's been profound and very, very positive. And not just from a coverage standpoint. Uh, the insurance world really helps clients, helps companies uh, drive economic growth, uh, increase global commerce, and obviously respond to catastrophes. If you just think about the whole idea of economic growth and job creation, this, this insurance world literally helps companies make decisions around expansion and growth they wouldn't have otherwise made. In global commerce, it's really about how they break down barriers to let capital come into an industry. Uh, as an example, City Rail here in the UK, we just finished uh, uh, an arrangement in which 1.5 billion pounds is coming into City Rail to help the Great Western Line uh, and obviously create thousands of jobs. It was made possible by a public-private partnership involving the UK and a Japanese investor. That yeah. doesn't happen without the insurance industry in the context yeah. of it. I mean, I think, uh, Mr. Sumi, I think what we would be interested to hear, because Tokyo Marine were obviously very heavily involved, you've mentioned the Thai floods. Just talk us through the process that, of, of, that the insurance industry uh, undertook to put Thailand and Bangkok back on its feet so quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, okay, uh, I will tell you the, the Thailand flood case of Tokyo Marine. Uh, Thailand flood caused uh, very serious property damage 
to the manufacturing uh, companies, facilities in Bangkok and the, the regions. And the, even worse, uh, as Greg said, that I mentioned that it, it led the uh, disruption of the global supply chain and followed by a large scale consequential losses. In case there are around uh, nearly 400 Japanese industries, manufacturers received a insurance payment of around 10 billion US dollars, uh, which enables early recovery and the resumption of operation. And the, thanks to insurance, the affected manufacturers stayed and contributed to the local economy by reviving their production activity and perhaps most importantly by sustaining the employment. Yeah, and I think another example uh, would be in, in the developed world would be Superstorm Sandy uh, in the east coast of the United States, particularly in New York, just a few months ago in a way. And uh, it was extraordinary, it, it has been extraordinary how quickly businesses have recovered and I was there last week and we received many plaudits, the insurance industry, for the speed with which, as they say in the States, we cut the checks. And uh, I think that, 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 was, uh, that, was a, that was a good example. Let's come on to, um, Nicholas, uh, the developing world, the growth countries, and how you look at that in terms of both, in a sense, that, that the service we're providing economists, but also the opportunity for the insurance industry. Well, I think that we are talking non-life, that the most important growth driver for us is the quantity of risk that is out there. And of course, we will grow with the original economies like the emerging markets. So it's not so much about demographics that sometimes people say that this uh, driver of growth in insurance, yes, but not in non-life. And for us, the challenge is being there and supporting. There's two major features of insurance in general, general insurance specifically. One is stabilizing, we talked about that as regards time, and the other one is what I call pacemaking. And that means securing investments, securing entrepreneurial activity, securing the activity of individuals. And it starts with micro-insurance at one end, yes. and it ends with securing huge enterprises, mm. and making sure that they can focus on growing their businesses, growing their countries, the entire economies being there, but I must admit, and you so kindly only insinuated it, we are falling behind as an insurance industry right now on the non-life side, behind the development of risk overall. So we really have to do a lot to catch up again and make sure that we offer coverage to those who need it. Not only micro-insurance is one big challenge, but also in terms of the new risks that we see out there. Yeah, and in terms of the, uh, how do you see the role of government in those new emerging countries? How do you see their role in enc encouraging uh, the insurance uh, penetration? Do you see a p some positive signs or do you find, do you think it's difficult, is it protectionist? It, yeah, it's, it's difficult, it depends. It's, for a reinsurer, for example, normally it's a lot easier because reinsurance does not rank so high on the priority list of governments sometimes and it is, seems to be more obvious that reinsurance might be helpful in stabilizing economies and, and, and pushing or pacing it. On the other hand, once you go into primary insurance, for whatever reason, we sense that there are, is a protectionistic approach. It takes longer to get up to the foreign direct investment levels that you would like to see, or the, the process of licensing takes slower. So there, I would say there is room for improvement. I know that the WTO was trying to support it, but many times it ends up with bilateral agreements. The EU, by the way, yes. is very helpful there yeah. too. But I think the, the governments of these emerging countries sometimes could do more, and it's not so much the small ones as rather the bigger ones. Yes. In, in that regard, Lunar was in Beijing on Monday and Tuesday. It, just as you said before, John, there is interest. They understand underpenetration. They understand the impact in their local economies when a uh, catastrophe happens and they can't respond. Uh, they want to take move. They want to take movement. Uh, but I agree with Nicholas, it's incumbent upon the industry to stay ahead of change. Uh, as we add value at a micro level to businesses, we're drawn in. Uh, if we're not doing that, we're not as drawn in. And I think that's 
that level of innovation around the industry is going to be the catalyst. It has historically been and will continue to be the catalyst to make us more relevant on behalf of companies around the world. Yeah. And okay, I have, I have told the, in case of the Thailand uh, accident, and the, I think in the absence of sound and rigid uh, insurance infrastructure, the country, the emerging country, might lose the means of to, mean to sustainable growth and the discourage new investment. And the, the Thai government, uh, the disaster led the Thai government to recognize the importance of the disaster management. And the, they are uh, implementing a government-backed indemnity system on natural hazards yeah. as, a, as a social infrastructure. Yeah. Exactly. And I think what we were, we were hearing earlier, there's been a lot of talk today about infrastructure. And I think, obviously, the insurance industry, uh, broadly defined, is going and does play a big role in financing that. But equally importantly, as, you, as you've heard from investors, sustainability of income, certainty of income is fundamental. And that is, in fact, what insurance provides. Mm -hmm because all of these infrastructure projects without insurance arguably are not financeable. So that is something which I think often is, it's not overlooked, but it's not fully recognized, I think. Now, let's turn to a, a, a different subject. Let's talk about, because here we are in London at the GIC, let's talk about London and insurance. And just tell me, perhaps we should start with you, Greg, as the, uh, the great advert for London. Tell us about, not partly how you feel about London as a centre for insurance on the one hand, and on the other hand also what some of you think that the issues and challenges are for London. Well, I, because you talked before, John, L London has a, just a very unique place in the global world of insurance. Um, it is a juxtaposition of 300 years worth of talent collection and knowledge and insight, as well as a, a critical mass of capability that clients need to get things done. And it isn't, just, isn't the underwriting expertise uh, and the, in the market knowledge, it's also the legal systems that surrounds it and all the support infrastructure, which makes London a very unique and powerful hub around the world. Uh, it has been for a long time and continues to be. It obviously factored into, as Aon thought about uh, the placement of our global headquarters and the move a little over a year ago, uh, it started in, it, with literally an understanding of the power and the capability of London, the London market and Lloyd's in the, in the context of the London market for sure. Uh, and was built on, by the way, a foundation that we heard this morning from Prime Minister Cameron around the five ideals and the foundation that sort of laid that out. So that combination uh, is a powerful one in terms of the world of insurance. And it isn't just, I would say, if I may, it isn't just uh, the conversation around the UK and London. For insurance, it is magnified quite substantially in the context of where we are. And that's how we've seen it. The piece around what to do, uh, again, I would come back to, it comes back to innovation and staying ahead. Uh, Nicholas is right. The world of risk is changing very, very quickly. It's incumbent upon us collectively to be ahead of that and innovate faster than the world's changing to stay, to stay relevant. And Nicholas, here you are, uh, a major European continental European giant, but with a syndicate at Lloyd's. Just, just to tell us about your feeling I can London. say very briefly, because I would sign everything that Greg said. I would only add one thing, and that was, to me, obvious all through the day today also. Politicians in the UK, and specifically in London, think fondly of insurance. There's not so many places out there where we feel welcome and considered valuable. That makes a huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that goes, of course, and stretches out and in, to include the regulator. How do you deal with the regulator? Yeah. And that, uh, that is really, for me, yeah. it's half of this. So the yeah. other half yeah. is what we're well, we'll come to regulation in a minute, regressively. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Sumi, would you, would you like to say a word about London? In fact, Tokyo Marine, I think, are our second or third biggest managing agent in London the, and the, in, with the Kiln Syndicate. And where they've been with us for a hundred, well, you've been connected with London for 120 years? 133 years. 133 yes. years. Fantastic. So just yeah. give us your up to date perspective of, uh, of London. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> next 100 years. <laughs> yes. We had invested uh, uh, a big, big investment to London, but the, I have noted 
move our headquarters to London. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but the London insurance market has uh, historically been fully diversified and uh, budding creativity. And it has been supporting and leading the world insurance market to develop in its role as the center of the global insurance excellence. Specifically, Lloyds of London has been at the core of world insurance market and uh, played a leading role for over 300 years. Uh, this is not a diplomatic words to John. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very and, nice to hear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And the, as I told you that the Tokyo Marine has one, 133 years long relationship with London market since uh, our establish, establishment in 1879. Yeah. And I do hope that the city of London stays as a unique and flexible market. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what I would say with my Lloyd's hat on uh, is that London is from many points of view, a very, very competitive place for us to operate in, partly because, frankly, of the quality of the underwriters that we have and the number that we have covering a hugely broad spectrum within London. And, and I think that is a, a unique asset. Uh, the second thing, I think, is that we have to recognize, and this is a challenge not just of innovation, it's a challenge of footprint, is that at Lloyd's, uh, most of our business still is in the developed world. 40% of our business, is, for example, is in the United States, and it's still growing. But uh, with this change in GDP uh, and the growth over the next 20, 25 years, we've launched our, so everyone's got a vision, ours is called Vision 2025, but this vision is really to make sure that we capture the footprint uh, in those developing countries. And we, we, we've, we've got some big investments where we've been making in the Far East, in Singapore, uh, where we have a hub in Shanghai and so on, and then further, uh, we're investing uh, a lot of time in South America. But that, I think, is a big challenge for uh, the insurance industry to really uh, get that footprint in because, not just because of the growth in GDP, but also this underinsurance I was talking about. And on the other side of the equation, for those economies, as they industrialize and commercialize, think what would have happened, for example, to Bangkok, one of the major cities in the world, if they had not been insured. It would have been extremely difficult, both economically and getting uh, things back on their feet that, that, uh, that quickly. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. And I think that the, there are some protectionist elements that you've been hearing. Uh, which is, is always there. I don't think it's, it's necessarily getting any worse, but it is there. Some countries obviously worse than others. But actually, we do not think, and I think governments, when they look at it, realize it is not in their best economic interest to, to raise the barriers. So let's move on uh, now to um, uh, a different subject, which is regulation. Um, we all love to bash regulators. But uh, we're not going to, <laughs> because I think we think there are some good elements in insurance regulation. But Nicholas, would you like, as the chairman of the Geneva Association, which is the industry body for the worldwide insurance sector, just to talk a bit about regulation, perhaps focusing on Europe in particular? Yeah. Well, Solvency 2 was mentioned, and since we are here sitting for non-life insurance, we are, I guess, more benign in our comments on Solvency 2. It still needs some recalibration on some specific insurance risk, but overall I think the industry is ready for it. Certainly the big companies are and they want it. The problem was mentioned by Tijan in the morning that we do sort of leapfrog from what I would call Basel 1 into Basel 4. And that really puts everyone under enormous amount of stress and the timing is extremely unfortunate for the introduction. But the concept as such, we at least think is entirely appropriate. It's a risk-based economic approach. We go for the risk first, and we try to look at the both sides of the balance sheet from a risk point of view, because in accounting today, mostly the assets are rather than mark to market, whereas the liabilities are not. And I don't care how we do it. As an investor, I would always go for both sides mark to market, and that's what Solvency do actually does. 
And in non-life insurance, the challenge is not as big as it is for the life or long-term insurers. No, so we welcome it. The uncertainty, the problem is the uncertainty right now. We are in the limbo situation for the question of the long-term guarantees. And therefore, we're going back and forth. My hope is that by the end of the year, the trilogue between the three institutions in Europe will come to terms and say, this is what we do, and this is when it starts. So then we can take, it will not be off our plate, but it, it, it costs more and more and more because we always have to adjust to the latest status. But summing it up, I think and we think it's a great system, basically. Mm, great. Yeah, again, we, I'll offer a view, really from a client's view, who, who asked the question, how should regulation work for the industry? Because, in fact, their access in the industry for capital to get the uh, volatility control you described, John. And uh, we often have a conversation um, with clients and with regulators that goes something like this. Um, I completely agree with Nicholas. The fundamental is absolutely correct. Uh, we all want to be regulated in the right way um, and pursue our business in the right way. Absolutely is correct. Um, there's, a, there's a piece around application yes. and thinking about the banking industry versus what is a, a set of economics that's fundamentally different than a bank product. Yeah. Uh, and I think just making sure that that's baked in and, you know, regulators have got a lot to do and the banking industry has really been more on the front page than this group has been on the front page. Uh, but just understanding that there's a difference and the application is, is quite important as they come to terms with making sure the right set of regulations are in place. Yeah. I mean, I think for, from where I sit, the, I'm personally a great believer in firm, tough, and prudential regulation for the insurance industry. Uh, we, in a sense, didn't have that until fairly recently. I think we now have got that. It's more prudential than it was, which I think is a good thing. Uh, the issue I think we all have, as you say, is application. And if you take Solvency 2, with which I, I agree with what's been said about Solvency 2 in terms of capital setting, we think it's good, we've adopted it in Lloyd's, we're already operating it. Uh, but it's the application which has been hugely un and unnecessarily expensive to the industry. And it has, it's frankly given Solvency 2, the European regulators, somewhat the UK regulators, a bit of a bad name, which is unfortunate because in fact, uh, the principle behind it, I think, is, is, is pretty good. If I may Nick, add yeah. one thought, and Greg triggered the thought, I must say, we have one elephant in the room right now, this is the question of systemic relevance. And here, based on what Greg said, since the two industries are distinctly different, different. in their business models, there is a danger that shortcuts are being taken yeah. from banking and saying what is good for banks probably might be good for insurers too. I think we got the message through now that the business models are different, but the inclination to declare companies globally systemically relevant according to the definition of the Financial Stability Board, for me academically is a real stretch. Mm. I would dare to say I can hardly think of anyone as long as insurance companies stick to the knitting means that they do insurance. Yeah. Of course, whoever runs an asset book can do silly things. And then, of course, you turn yourself into something systemically relevant. But if you stick to insurance as it is, you shouldn't be systemically relevant. Yes. As a government, you should do everything to avoid that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, one, th one question I have is, do we feel that the regulators, we were undoubtedly caught in the backwash of the banking crisis. Do we feel that they now have got, as they say in the UK, got the gig? that insurance is different from banking. I think that message did get through in the meantime. We were lucky because we could progress the native process. There was a rush at the beginning. Politicians wanted to deliver on the Pittsburgh event. Yeah. And then they wanted to come up with the list of insurers. But yeah. we managed to get them back into the drawing room and rediscuss and to see how different the business models are. Yeah. There is a political tendency, and I understand it to some extent at least, to declare at least some because how can you have a list of 28 banks and no one on the insurance list? So this is a hard one to sell for the yeah, politician. Yeah. And from looking at it from Japan, at regulation generally, I know you feel happier with domestic Japanese regulation, but how do you feel about the impact that international regulation is having on your business, sumi -san? I think that the Japanese regulation will be also impacted by the European Solvency too. Yeah. But now, the current uh, Japanese regulator, FSA, is very flexible and friendly to us. I have, no, uh, I have very 
satisfied it. But I, I also oh, think that we still have to stay cautious since excessive restrictions, excessive regulations could interfere in the industrial growth while sacrificing the efficiency of the social system. I think. Yeah. And I think, I mean, another point we've heard, we heard the Prime Minister on it this morning, it absolutely applies to uh, the insurance sector. Particularly, this is not just a UK issue, it's actually a Europe issue. Because if you look at Europe, including Germany, France, uh, Italy, <coughs> the UK in particular, we have there, apart from uh, the leading corporates in the UK and, and Lloyds of London, we have, as we have here, some of the, well, we have the largest and most international of the insurance carriers based in Europe. Now, the EU regulations, which are being thrown at us all the time, we have to be very careful that they don't render the European industry uncompetitive. Uh, and that is, that is a danger which will obviously uh, affect London. So I think uh, what we might do is just uh, open it up for some questions where we've got a little bit more time but not much and then I'll come back for a couple of uh, other, other <coughs> comments in a minute. So just uh, any questions? Yeah. Wynne. John, uh, Wynne Bischoff, Lloyds Banking Corporation. I'd um, like to make two points uh, really, one, one point and one question. The, the comment is that I'm delighted, very pleased that Lloyd's has got such a good name uh, and I hope to be benefiting uh, by proxy <laughs> at, at, at some time from this. The question though is, <laughs> right, <laughs> the question is, is, is slightly different. This is a global business, uh, it's competitive and London's position in this is uh, not, not absolutely certain because there is great expansion taking place. Do you feel, or does the panel feel, that the association of having a, an insurance market needs almost automatically to be a part of a larger financial market? I, is London's insurance, is Lloyd's position, your position rather than mine, is your position really enhanced by having a financial centre? Uh, and therefore, does this impact places like Bermuda, which obviously is very, very is an important market, but is very much smaller? Um, rather than interesting, um, I'd, I'd be very interested in your comments. Yes, and it's a question that, that one often uh, asks oneself and often considers. Rather than me answering it with my Lloyd's hat on, which I've got a very clear view on, let me uh, turn to, uh, to our biggest customer first, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always follow John, of course. <laughs> uh, the, uh, fundamentally, uh, we think there is, it is enhanced because part of this is not just the basic underwriting uh, risk and risk management function. It really is all the things that surround it and really bring it to life on behalf of clients. But fundamentally, it comes back to are we helping clients, yes or no? Fundamentally, are we helping clients improve operating performance, strengthen their balance sheet, or reducing volatility? If we're doing one of those three things, and it emanates through Lloyd's, and by the way, the competitive advantage starts with that, starts and stops with that. That's why innovation is so critically important. As long as this marketplace continues to evolve in that way, the strength on the global scale actually gets, goes up. If it, for whatever set of reasons that retards, it does exactly what you've described. Uh, and the ingredients are here, the history is here, and we just all have to collectively make sure it happens. Adding some flavor, I doubt it. I'm not so sure whether it is helpful. The business models are different. Yeah. The cultures are very different. There are parts of the business where we have an overlap. On the asset side, it's obvious. Some things we have in common there. On the other hand, the approach to the business is different. So that may be enriching for the two cultures being close to each other. There is businesses that are being blurred, take credit risk. We take it on both sides of the balance sheet. We need the same talents to some regard. On the other hand, the cultures are different, and that's why I would always say both is possible, and that's why we are in both places. We're in places where you have insurance only, we're in places where there's banking as well. So I would rather say, let's wait another 100 years to really find out. <laughs> I, I mean, I must admit, being a, I spent 30 odd years as a banker before mm. having a 10 year break before coming to insurance. And I, one thing that I have noticed is that there is very little uh, 
because of the different business models, there's very different, little synergy between yeah. banking and insurance. It's obvious because we tend to get our premiums in advance. Mm -hmm. We invest. Uh, we don't, in a sense, need a lot of what the banking system provides. On the other hand, I think where, where I, I would be cautious is, is people. I think one of the great things about insurance is that over the last uh, 10, 20 years, the quality of the people coming into the insurance industry has increased dramatically. The professionalism has, uh, has increased. And when you look at the work, the mathematical modeling, for example, that's done on catastrophe risk, this is absolutely state of the art. And you need to have an environment where there is a, a hotbed, if you like, of financial expertise, lifestyle, all the rest of it, which attracts really good people. And I think London does that. And it's certainly, I see very clear signs of it in, 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 in Lloyd's. And one of the other things, I think, just coming back to the challenge uh, that I was talking about earlier, uh, in terms of increasing our footprint, part of the Lloyd's strategy is to attract really high quality trade carrier capital from emerging countries with people. And we think that will hugely enrich the level of expertise in the insurance market, in the, in the, obviously in my case, particularly in the specialist mm -hmm. sector. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but I think we think that. Right, should we take another question? Yeah, there. Hi, David De Serra. A question for Nicholas. Do you believe that Mark Carney, as chairman of the Financial Stability Board, could cut a long story short on the too big to fail, also on the insurance side, just by asking to convert all the hybrid debt that insurance company holds are subordinated in contingent convertible? So that basically, we all have more capital in case it's needed, uh, and just transform what today it's called capital, but in reality it's debt, hybrid debt. Um, into, you know, pre-funded rights issue for the future in case someone is wrong. Did you get that? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure whether I know the answer, to be honest. The, the criteria are sort of clear now. And I guess that the, the ranking of insurers in general and the question whether they get in, put into certain baskets probably will be driven more by the asset side of the balance sheet, yes. And crucial will be what one calls non-traditional non-insurance activities. So if you, on the asset side of your balance sheet, start to do things that are not necessarily linked to the liability side, then you run a higher risk. And then derivatives, big time derivative trading, securities lending, short term commercial paper to enhance your return. These are things that get you into that pocket easily. As long as you can convince your regulator that you are just replicating your liabilities to the extent you can, and do not try to create extra alpha, you have a better life. If you own an entire asset manager along with it, the sheer size of the asset manager may push you into that pocket, just for being big, mm. which is not sticking to the very criteria of the FSB, but sometimes size knocks you shut into it. That's why I'm not sure. The answer to me is not clear yet to your question, but I think the decision will be taken on the asset side of the balance sheet. Yeah. OK, another question? Yeah, here. Thanks. Uh, thank you. John Godfrey from Legal and General. Um, I'm delighted, Chairman, you covered the, the issue of underpenetration, where governments decide to self-insure, which is to say to not insure. Uh, this is a, a connected question because governments and insurance companies, and insurance broadly defined, fish a great deal in the same pool of addressable risk. And I wondered if the panel thought that given governments are constrained in their spending ability, uh, whether there could be a further adjustment between what is done uh, through the private sector with, by insurance companies and what is done through the public sector through tax and spend. I'm thinking here particularly around some of the issues of, uh, uh, of welfare funding, for example, uh, health care and other risks of that sort. Greg, you want to? Yeah, I, I, I think, again, back to the whole public-private um, you know, uh, section here, um, the conversations we've been having really is around uh, fostering capital into the industry, private capital. Uh, there are clearly areas where governments have to play a role. Uh, terrorism, as an example, backstop to Brexit allow capital to come in. But beyond that, um, it would be our view that the private sector uh, entrance here 
is a very, very powerful one. You go back to Thailand and Bangkok, in the end, if that's fully self-funded by the government, where do you end up? Uh, and in the end, by the way, the cross-subsidy within country, uh, we're having this, con we have this conversation in the U.S. as well, a government backstop's fine until it's, you're subsidizing someone else uh, that, uh, that you don't ever see in that context. It becomes much, much more difficult. So clearly there's a role, and by the way, clearly it's practiced from a government standpoint, but um, the more we see these balance sheets get involved at a micro level with businesses in countries around the world, the more robust the economic system, uh, the more power, the more growth. And so yeah. the more you foster that, the more you get out of it from our standpoint. And you can see that in a number of countries where they've internationalized, they've allowed private sector capital in. It, it, it has had a, a real impact on growth, security, all the rest of it. And you know, regrettably, there are other cases which we can see in places like India or Pakistan where, frankly, it's a real problem. Right. And uh, the, the protectionist barriers are not helping them. There's also a piece which is the discipline around risk management actually doesn't happen uh, as well when it's sort of covered from a public standpoint. It's there as a backstop, but the day-to-day -day operations of a business don't change as much. When you actually have balance sheets investing money, they force a discipline which changes the operating outcome. That actually improves, that actually improves the underwriting. Yeah. There are interesting examples in the world. It's a non-life panel, and I should probably add non-health as well <laughs> to <laughs> avoid it's an that. Unhealthy but panel. If you stick to non-life in the narrower sense, you have PP, well, private-public partnerships, for example, on the agro side in the U.S. Yeah. A very interesting example. And here's what, what you said, Greg: that the government says yes, there's something to do. It's WTO compatible if we subsidize premium. But we do not ourselves run the fund of the assets in the first place, nor do we settle claims. And right. so what we leave that all to the private industry. The advantage or disadvantage is that the corridor of earnings or losses is a slimmer one. But, well, it's up to us to decide whether we want to be in yeah. the business. We think that makes sense in that very yeah. one. And there's other examples. But cat business is one. Do we want the Florida state to take up the bill, do the taxpayers of Florida want it, to take up the bill for those losses? I think they shouldn't, yeah. but they do. Yeah. Okay, one more question, yes. Sorry, could you just speak into the microphone? Sorry. We like to know there are this, this four years, there has been a lot of uh, banking losses, hedge funds losses, different things happen, people are concerned about it, how to invest now, where to invest now, with their risk factor, whether the insurance has a product which protects the interest of the private sector's individuals who are wealth management, different programs they have. Various hedge funds, biggest hedge funds in the United States, everybody knows about it, went in a big loss. And now people are concerned about it, by the trade financing, we, we have a bank, you know, Hinduja Bank, we have a bank in India as well. We are trying to see that how the risk factor insurance has a product where they invest on certain countries or in certain stock market or bonds where people have lost, like in Greece, I mean to say many yes. people have lost, in, you see, in Greece, or maybe they may lose much more in many other countries. Is there any insurance product which can be introduced to give satisfaction to the foundations or to the wealth managements, that they are protected so that their wealth is covered. It's better to earn less than to lose everything. Right. And which has happened, like the Jewish community, for example, their foundations, they invested in the famous what, the Murdoff or, uh, company in US, you know, in a big way. If they had insurance, they would have at least protected their, their wealth. What is the precautions I'll request to the panel for the future strategy of life, how they can create safe side, having an insurance, and they are protected from all the calamities. Yeah. Thank you. Nicholas, do you I could. Well, first of all, we are a non-life panel. That, that's why the answer is so much easier. <laughs> we only do one thing, replicate the liabilities. So it is not our first concern what the return is. The first consideration is what's the duration, what's the currency exposure, and what's the inflation sensitivity. Then we look for the asset that best matches these three things. And then we look if we make a decent return. But since we take a risk-based approach, higher return means more risk. The value proposition of insurance on the non-life side normally is decorrelate, detach from the capital market and create the value on the liability side of the balance sheet. So that's why for us, 
The asset return has relevance in the pricing, yes, but it's not the absolute return. That's why my answer is relatively easy. And when it comes to the investment universe, diversify, diversify, diversify. It's a very general answer, I know it, but it's basically that simple or that difficult. Okay, so, sorry, you want please go ahead. So just, let me just bring it back to the panel and just throw one last thing at you. Um, here we have, we're very fortunate to have three of the leading businessmen from the United States, Germany, and Japan. Uh, we listened to the Prime Minister this morning about the EU and Europe, but what I would like to hear are your comments on the UK's <laughs> position uh, <laughs> uh, as both business partners of ours, investors in the UK. What, what, what would your advice be to the audience here in terms of the UK's position on the EU? Do you want to kick off, uh, Mr. Sumi? Why don't you oh. kick off? <laughs> oh, difficult uh, questions. And the, as you know well, that's the, now the Japan is uh, becoming a totally different countries uh, half years ago, and the, now the Japanese uh, stock market is booming. Uh, stock price is uh, rising. I don't know the exact reason, but and the, <laughs> but the, we Japan has uh, still a lot of difficulties. Uh, we have to find a new growth strategy, domestic growth strategy. Uh, I think that's the. UK has the uh, same difficulties. The not only the board monetary easing and the government spending, but I think that the, the most important thing is the growth strategy, both in Japan and the UK. So the, this morning's uh, Prime Minister's speech is very very en energetic, yeah. and the, uh, I'm very happy to watch him. Yeah, good. So, uh, so on the EU, Greg, uh, from the US <laughs> point of view, just, just so, give us some advice. So, I, yeah, there's, there's no advice to be had, but I would observe, and uh, maybe it's uh, um, from around the world, look, at the end of the day, uh, EU uh, unification, consistency, uh, you can make the own decisions around currency, but stability and clarity. Stability and clarity. In essence, for many business leader around the world, you can't ask for more than that, but you absolutely need that to make investments and to drive forward. So the sooner we can get stability and clarity around where you're going, very, very important, and there's some obvious outcomes that you've got to have. Yeah, I agree. Uncertainty is not a good thing. Now, Nicholas, from inside the tent of the EU, yeah. uh, well, to, to, and to j just relate your comments also to competitiveness and the German view versus the UK view. Well, I think that the uh, European Union without the UK is no European Union. Two, I think the European Union needs a lot of UK, and as a German, I meant that Germany even more so. Yeah. So if we deduct the noise from whatever is irrelevant in politics to make your position clear to whoever in the party or outside the party. If you deduct all that, what basically was said, I would say 80% of the Germans, if not 100, would sign it right away too. Recalibrating the setup in Europe, making sure we go for the right goals. And I think when you talk strategy, always it's first talk about what we want to achieve. And yeah. that get, tends to get forgotten and we meddle around all the time. What is it standing for? Stability, predictability, whatever. If you get that clear, I think the answer to the other questions is not so difficult. Mm. It, it's an entirely different question if we talk currencies, but we did talk about European Union now. Yes, yes. But, but into, and you think that there is a cultural uh, similarity of approach, for example, as between the UK and Germany towards competitiveness, regulation, and so on. Do you feel that or not? Now it's getting, I'm getting into dangerous territory here. <laughs> I would say there is nations in Europe that sort of uh, are closer together in terms of the, the approach to business and the economy, right. and the mix is irrelevant, but the UK adds something very relevant to that overall right. steering of the economy. Fine. That's why it's crucial, and if you want to stay competitive in Europe, 
I cannot yeah. imagine a euro with a, a weakened or lesser UK. No. Yeah. Good. Well, now, uh, uh, can I just say we, 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 the, the finance ministers have joined us, so we're going to get kicked out here. Uh, <laughs> but I think I, I would like to thank hugely uh, Greg, Nicholas, and Sumisan. Uh, and they, you know, they've come from the United States, Germany, and Japan to be here today. But I think they provided us with a very good warm-up warm act, if I may say so, for the ladies and gentlemen sitting over here. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>